just some random thoughts about the Super Bowl. Everybody likes sports, or not everybody, but a lot of people like sports. And the cool thing about sports, like the Super Bowl or any kind of sporting event, is it gathers people, right? I bet a lot of you guys, or just by a show of hands, how many of you guys were at like a barbecue or like a luncheon where you're with people celebrating Super Bowl, watching, yelling at the TV, wondering why the games were so boring and all of these things were going on, but the halftime show was pretty good, right? Yeah. Yes. So. The Super Bowl and any kind of sporting events, it gathers people. And here in Hawaii, we do it with who? We do it with our families. We do it with our friends. It's like four people now. We do it with our family, we do it with our friends, and we do it with our loved ones. And we do it because we just love, it, love being with people. It's just part of culture here in Hawaii. But there's something that I notice every time that you have kind of like a football-themed thing in Hawaii is everybody comes in different jerseys, right? Even tonight, I can guarantee you, people in Carolina and people in... Denver were wearing their team's jerseys. But here in Hawaii, people wear everything and anything because we don't have a professional team. We don't have a professional NFL team. We don't have a professional NBA team. We don't have a professional baseball team. We don't have a professional hockey team. If you're here, you choose who you want to support, right? And that's just one of, one of those things that happens during this time where a lot of people in Hawaii have different kinds of, fa or fans of different kinds of sports teams. And I think when it comes to football, you see a lot of people in Hawaii they enjoy following the Raiders. Any Raiders fans here? Two. We got Cowboys fans. Anyone here like the Cowboys? Yeah. One. This is not making me look very good. How many of you guys like the 49ers? Okay, yeah. there's a little bit more. How many of you guys like the Steelers? Yeah. All right. So in Hawaii, there's teams that we kind of tend to like, and we become fans of them. So no matter what, how they're doing, no matter what they're going through, we follow them and we support them. But you can be a follower of a team or a fan of a team, but there's also those teams that come up that you kind of enjoy because they're doing well. And that's what we call a hype team, right? And what are the hype people about? They're bandwagon fans, right? And we kind of know about a couple teams in Hawaii that weren't really important. Is that the right word to say? It wasn't really important. Like who cared about the Washington like, or the Seattle Seahawks, right? Until they became really good. Jason, I'm sorry. I know you enjoy. You've been a true fan. I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, and then how many of us actually even like the Panthers until this year? Right, nobody. I don't get it. But then on my social media feed and everything that you talk about, even at the stores that you see jerseys at, people began to like these teams because they were doing well, right? But when they do bad, what happens? You jump off the bandwagon. You no longer follow these teams. You no longer care how they're doing. And you go back to the teams that you were originally for and originally rooting for. And that's something that we see, right? We see it all the time. People jump on a hype, and then they get off the hype. People jump on another hype, and then they get off of that. But there's a huge difference between being a fan of a team based on hype and success temporarily versus being a devoted follower and somebody that no matter how good or bad they're doing, you're going to love how they perform and love what they do because you're just, just that into them. And when I think of a, a person like that, I think of our very own Chad Udani. Chad, is he here? Yeah, he's right there. And Chad Udani loves the, he loves the Bengals. How many of you guys love the Bengals? The two in the back, Chad and Michelle, they love the Bengals. And this is a cool thing I love about Chad is because ever since I've met him, he's always been a Bengals fan. It wasn't because they had a pretty good year this year. You know, they started off with a winning record and they had an undefeated streak for a little bit, but he was always a fan of them. But then what I noticed when they were in that streak was a lot of people began to post about the Bengals, the Bengals this, the Bengals that, and all of that kind of stuff. And then I'm around Chad, and then he's like, he kind of has like this thing about him where he's like, oh, yeah, hype fans, man. Hype fans, don't like them. You know, and then like, you know, something that he started to mention about the Bengals because it was, they were picking up steam, right? And I think the reason why Chad kind of felt that way is because even before this team had a little bit of success, and they've been pretty decent over the years, but even before people jumped on the bandwagon, he was a true follower of the Bengals. And he kind of took it to heart, knowing like, well, where were you that year? You're just here now. What's up with that, you know? I'm just trying to talk like Chad, because I picture that's how he would say it, because I've heard it. But the reality is this, is sometimes we're like that with God, right? We jump on the bandwagon because we had an amazing experience at service. We heard an amazing word. We had a great time in worship. Somebody said something over us when they were praying that we really liked, and then we kind of look at God and we're like, I am all in. I am ready to be a follower forever and ever and ever. But then the thing is, right, when that hype dies, when things start to kind of go wrong, 
when the whole Christian thing gets boring and the same song gets played over and over and over again at worship, at service, when you've heard every message, when you've read every scripture, and then when all of the things that are going around in the world look a lot more better than coming to church on a Sunday, we jump off the bandwagon of Jesus. And sometimes it's not that shallow. Sometimes we pray, right? We pray to God, God, answer my prayers. Heal this person. Bring breakthrough in this area of my life. Provide for my finances. Provide for my career. And we expect God to do all of these things. And maybe on our timing, maybe not in the way that we expect. He doesn't meet our expectations. And then all of a sudden, this God that we worshiped on a Sunday, we really get to see if we were truly followers of him or if we were just a bandwagon fan that jumped on the recent hype, the recent cool thing, and the recent thing that we can get excited about because something else will pop up. And that's what we're gonna be looking at tonight. The difference between what it is to be a fan or a follower of God. And the title of tonight's message is Can't Stand the Heat. And we'll kind of dialogue about that in a little bit in the passages that we're gonna be reading. But before we do, can you guys please join me in prayer? God, we wanna thank you that you were our biggest fans. God, that you see the things that we've been through, the things that we're going through, and the things that we're having to endure because of. God, and even though we're so fickle sometimes with how we view you, where we put you on our time, where we put you on our boundaries and, and our expectations, God, we thank you that you've remained patient and you've remained the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God, we pray that this, this evening that you will speak to every single one of us, that you will impart something that's real in us. God, and I pray that you will even show us in our hearts the difference of what it is to be a fan or a follower because as we look into your word tonight, there's a huge difference, there's a big difference, and you wanna take us from fan to eternal follower. And we thank you for every person here. Not one person is here by accident, God. You're speaking to them even at this moment. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. In your, in your notes, number one says this, a follower of God stands firm in their faith. And tonight we're gonna be looking in the book of Daniel, specifically Daniel 3, and let me just talk a little bit about it and set it up. So in Daniel 3, you're introduced to a few guys, and they're from Judah, and in Judah was a bunch of Jews. And basically, if you were a Jew, that meant you were God's chosen people in the Old Testament. You were his, his chosen sons and daughters, and you worshiped God, you lived by his word, you did everything according to that. So. There was Daniel, and Daniel was a prophet, and he was one of the top prophets of his time. And he had a couple friends, or three friends, and their names are Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And all of these guys were really good at what they did. They were cultured, they were educated, they were witty, they were articulate, they were smart. They were kind of like that higher end set of people in Judah. And they loved God, they were devoted to God, they were devoted to his teaching and his law, and they followed him everywhere that God had called them to go. That's just who they were. And in essence, they were basically college students like us, or young adults. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, and Daniel, a lot of people believe, were our age. In their, well, I don't know how young or old you guys are personally, but a lot of them were prop, a, lot, a lot of them believe that they were in their 20s to early 30s. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, and Daniel. Now, this is in Judah, and then all the way in Babylon, as if it's this side of, the, of this place, right, Babylon different place. There's this guy named King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar was obviously a king and he dictated everything that was going on. And he wanted to build his empire and build his kingdom. And what he wanted to do was bring in the brightest, the smartest, the wittiest, the most cultured. And he wanted them to grow in, in Babylon, learn what he knows, teach them about their culture, teach them about the way that they did things. And he wanted them to be the leaders, the movers and shakers of Babylon. So he sends out his officials and the officials go and they go to Judah. And then they find Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego and Daniel and they're like, yo, you guys need to come with us to Judah or to Babylon because you gotta meet this king and he wants to use you guys to do great things. So Meshach, Shadrach, Abednego, and Daniel, they all go. And when they go to Babylon, they get a lot of favor because God made them amazing people. God gave them gifts and talents. Daniel was a, a dream interpreter, he was a prophet. And in that time, King Nebuchadnezzar had this dream that he wanted to be interpreted. And he asked all of these people, the magicians, the, the enchanters, the witch, witchcraft people, he was like, hey, tell me what my dream means. And nobody was able to answer them until one of the officials was like, hey, try, try this Daniel guy. So Daniel prays to God and he asks God to reveal what this dream was. God reveals it to him. He goes to King Nebuchadnezzar and in an instant, King Nebuchadnezzar is like, you guys, you four from Judah, you guys are amazing people, and I want you guys to be officials in Babylon. So immediately they raised, they are, they raised, they are raised up 
into, into Babylon and as officials of King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. And let's pick it up in Daniel 3, verse 10 to 12, because King Nebuchadnezzar decides to make a law. And this is what we're going to read right now. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have sent over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Now let's just make it really clear, right? What King Nebuchadnezzar did was he made like this big statue of gold and it was of him because he was the king. Therefore, he was his people's God. And what he wanted to do, if you ever heard a flute or a musical instrument playing, was wherever you were, if you were in Babylon, you had to bow down in that moment to wherever this golden statue was placed because he is the king He makes the rules, and he has authority over your life. But what the officials find out is Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were unwilling to bow down, right? And the reason why they were unwilling to bow down was because they put God first. God was number one in their life. And we know that because the Jews followed the Ten Commandments, and one of the Ten Commandments was this, you shall have no other gods before me. And there was no compromise in Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Their God was their God. They would not bow down. They would not put aside their faith or compromise their faith because somebody told them to bow down to another God. And I think that's something that we need to look, look at in our lives because basically what they were unwilling to do was put an idol before God. And what an idol is, is anything. It could be a person, it could be your career, it could be money, it could be your personal like, mindset, your preference about life or whatever it may be. If you put that thing and that dictates your life before the law and truth of God's word, it's called an idol. And a lot of us have idols in our lives, it's true. Like, I have idols. We all have idols. There's things that we always have to wrestle with as believers. It's just like, man, is this God or is this me? Is this relationship honoring God? Is the things that I'm pursuing in my life honoring God? Is my perception, is my unforgiveness, is my attitude, is the things that I say honoring God? Is the people that I'm trying to please honoring God? Is the things that I'm doing to please the people that I want to please honoring to God? And if it's not, but you're pursuing those very things because it brings you gratification. It gives you affirmation. It gives you security before God. And that's an idol in your life. And it's something that you've put before God. But this was something, and it could be a statue. That was the idol that was in Babylon. It was a statue. And we have to look at our lives. What are those idols? Because I think tonight God is surfacing things in all of our hearts. Because the point of part one is this. A true follower always puts God first. We're in the Super, Super Bowl Sunday, so I figured as we kind of carry on with tonight's message, we kind of put in some football-themed examples and storylines, and I don't have a whole lot, but this past December, I got to have an amazing experience that's always been on my bucket list, which was to watch a professional football game at an NFL stadium live. So Pastor Billy, Pastor Kalai, Michelle Paxton, and myself, we had to go to Washington, D.C., and we went to Washington, D.C. because every nation campus, we had like a staff summit. And we had a free Monday. So we decided to go watch the Washington Redskins at FedEx Stadium host the Dallas Cowboys. And for me, I just wanted to experience it, and I wanted to take photos. So that was like my whole thing. I just want to say that I went to a stadium, I saw a football game, and I had a good time. And I got to take some some photos. So you all know who that is, right? And then him. (laughs) And then that guy, Kirk Cousins, right? Kirk Cousins. Right, next one. And then like a random shot on the field. Those were photos I took. And I enjoyed taking them because I was at the field. Now, we have like some fun stories regarding it, and I thought one of it was, was this. Um, we went, and then we tried to take a GPS to go the easiest route to FedEx Stadium. But it actually took us through the hood. And like the hood in Washington, D.C., very different from Waipahu, where I'm from. And I remember we were driving late at night because their games aren't early in the af- afternoon. They actually play very late. So I think it was, it, the, the game started at 8 p.m., 8 p.m. on a Monday night, and, but we're like, no, we got to do this. So we bought the tickets, and then we drove, and it took us literally through the hood because we wanted to get out of the freeway because we thought there would be traffic. So we went through all of these back roads, and it was scary because as you're driving through the back roads, you see just you know, people, and then they see you, 
and then you lock your door. You know, like that's essentially what you're doing, right, when you're in the hood. Now, if you're from the hood, I'm sure it's fine. I'm just saying it because I don't know what else to say. Neighborhood, but that's essentially hood. So we'll just go with the word hood. Um, we're going through there. We get to FedEx Stadium and we're running late, okay? And um, we're like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna go park, but where are we gonna park? And then we saw like the entrance to park. But then when we got there, we saw a sign that said um, season ticket holders only. So we weren't supposed to park there. But then we went there and then we're like, oh, we're gonna have to turn all the way around, we're gonna get rerouted, and then we're gonna go around and around and around, and then we're not gonna be able to watch the game. And we were already preparing, for, or I wanted to see the kickoff personally, and I wanted to see like the national anthem and all of those kinds of things too. And I was like, oh, we're not gonna get to see it. So we get to the guy at the gate, and then um, Michelle was like, hey, like, we're so sorry, we're from Hawaii. If you're on the mainland, and you need to like, just, just excuse yourself for things that you're doing that's not of mainland etiquette, just say that you're from Hawaii, and then everyone like, gives you a thumbs up, and like, ah, oh, it's okay. So anyway, we're there, right? And then we're, like at, we're, at the, we're at the gate, and then Michelle's like, I'm so sorry, we're from Hawaii, and um, we, we're in the wrong parking lot, like we're not season ticket holders, and all this kind of stuff. And then the guy kind of looks at Michelle, and then he's like, yo, but you can park here for 20 bucks. And then I was like, cool. And then I'm in the back, just kind of like, just watching this, and then Michelle's like doing all of this on the side, and then she gives him 20, and then we get to park in the season ticket holder lot, which was super close to the entrance, and we basically got to go in, and it was awesome. And then when we got in, you see all of the fans, because it was a huge stadium. There were so many people, like Aloha Stadium like sits 50,000 people, but that is FedEx Stadium. And I also, I also took that photo, it was really nice, right? But um, when we got in, we actually somehow magically ended up next to the field, legally, maybe not legally, I don't know. But we were there, and that's where I took the initial photos, but then we had to go all the way to the top, um, to the nosebleed section, standing room only, and that's where we were located. Now, we're talking about Redskins, right? They were the ones hosting this, but what do you guys see littered in all of the Redskin fans? You guys see a lot of Dallas fans, right? And there was a lot of them. And there was one in particular, and I think his name was Carlos, we're not too sure, but we're just gonna call him Carlos because he's from the hood, right? And then like Carlos is there, and then he's like totally like, he's a Dallas fan. So in the area that we're sitting, you have the three of us from Hawaii that's wearing no jerseys because we're from Hawaii, and then you have this Dallas guy that's wearing a Dallas jersey, and then all around us you have all, oh, not that one yet. Oh, that's just on that monitor. Just scratch this last two seconds, I'm sorry. But we get there, right? And then there's this one guy that loves Dallas, there's us, and then there's like a sea of Redskins fans. And this guy was like, just, he just wanted to initiate trouble. So every time a Dallas play happened that was good, he'd be like, yeah, man, in your face. And then like, and that's not how he sounded, but that's what I heard, right? And then you have all of these other people, all of the Redskins fans like, you suck, you suck, you suck. And then he's like, dude, like, we're gonna beat you guys. We're gonna beat you guys. And it's just this back and forth thing. Now, if you were at that game and we were there, it was really boring for the first three and a half quarters because nothing was happening until the very end, okay? And the score, I believe, was like, I was really low. And then basically this is what happened. Washington scored on a touchdown pass from their quarterback to LaShawn Jackson. That was the last photo. And I got to catch it right there. Now he caught it, and then all you hear all around the arena is like, ah! and then you got people like kicking like everything, and like all of these cool things were happening because their team won. Their team won, right? Or at least it seems like they did. Well, actually, they didn't win because they just forced overtime. But that's what happened. And everybody was stoked and everybody was excited until nine seconds later when Dallas was able to get into scoring position and with nine seconds on the clock, Dan Bailey scored on a 54-yard field goal kick. And then all of a sudden, all of the people that were like screaming and yelling and excited and like bashing on Carlos, and then they started cussing and screaming, and then they still started kicking things on the side. It was pretty awesome. So win or lose, you can still kick things. I don't know. But that's what happened right before our eyes. All of the Washington Redskins fans were on like this moment of elation, and then in nine seconds, done. But you know who enjoyed that moment? Carlos enjoyed that moment, <laughs> because what he started doing was turning to all of the people that was bickering to him throughout that night, and he was being cool, but he was very, being very intentional. Yep, who won now, huh? Who won now, huh? And then this was kind of what you see all throughout the night, is Dallas fans, Redskin fans, even Redskin fans with each other, just arguing and fighting, arguing and fighting. 
And what is my point in all of, all of, all of this? You're just wondering why I put it in. Well, it brings us to our second point. A follower of God will experience hardship and persecution because of their faith. The fact that Carlos loved the cowboys meant that because he was in redskin territory, he was going to suffer for his faith in the cowboy team. He was gonna receive persecution. And that's how we feel sometimes, right? Like we're a Christian, we're a believer, and then all of a sudden, everything starts happening to us. We start getting persecuted, we start going through hardships. And let's go back to Daniel 3 and let's see what happened because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were unwilling to bow down to the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, It is true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up. Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Persecution and hardship because they had faith in God. And we experience it all the time, right? Because it's different. Like when everything is just basic and when everything is good, right? You're at, you're at the coffee shop. You have like your Christian music on your iPad. You have your Christian journal open and you're journaling Christian things after you're reading your Christian Bible. And then you have two highlighters and two pens and you have post-its that you're gonna write your favorite scripture on and post it on something later, right? In that moment, everything is so good, right? I am loving this Jesus Christ because everything is awesome. I'm gonna love him and serve him and worship him and serve other people and all of these things. I'm gonna reach out to everyone. And then we leave that coffee shop or we leave service or we leave grace group and then we get back into the real world and then we realize because of our faith, our friends, they rag on us all the time because we don't want to get drunk with them on the weekends. You know, we start to lose like relationship with our boyfriend or girlfriend because they're like, man, if you're gonna live purely and you don't want to have sex until we're married, pfft, gone, right? And let's get real, like sometimes it even gets hard with our family members. We're like in a moment where you're seeing your father abuse your mother. What are you gonna do then? You're just gonna have to deal with it because this God loves you? Or is it because you expect it to be better than how it already is? Like these are the real moments that we receive as Christians, right? When people look in you in your face and they basically ridicule you and persecute you because you choose not to do certain things or because you do certain things. Or let's even take it personally, right? Like there's things that sometimes we pray about. There's things that we're believing for. There's things that we want God to bless us with or bless someone else with and it doesn't turn out the way that we want. And then we shake our fists at God and be like, well, how are you gonna do this to me? Why didn't you do what I asked you to? Because you love me, right? Because this worship song is good, right? Because that message that I heard at service was good, right? Then don't I deserve this? Don't, am I not entitled to how good that your blessings are in my life? Like, where are you at now, God? Why aren't you doing all of these things? And it's amazing when hardship and persecution really reveals to us if we're true followers of God or if we're just temporary fans on a hype. And it's something that we wrestle with every day. We're not gonna be perfect. It's not gonna be always easy to do those kinds of things. But it's something genuine that we will always wrestle with. Because when you're a Christian and you're a believer, persecution comes at you. And see, the reality is, like, we can, we get worried. Because when we lose those idols, right, those things that we care about, if we lose that relationship, if, if we lose that status or the popularity, if we lose friends in the process and all of these kinds of things, then what does that mean for me? What does that mean for me if I lose my status and popularity? What does it mean to me if I lose my finances or I lose this or I lose that? And we wonder, does God still love us? But the thing is, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they weren't facing popularity. They weren't facing a relationship. They were facing their lives because if they chose not to bow down to the golden statue, it was made very clear to them, they would be thrown into a burning furnace and they would die. And in that moment, what did they do? Is they chose to honor God. And we'll look at that in a little bit. But see, the thing when it comes to persecution, persecution when you're a Christian, it's just, it's part of the game. It's part of what you go through. Let's look at 1 Peter 4, 12 to 16. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. 
If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of God and of, the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. If you're here tonight and you're suffering, you're feeling like you're being put into a furnace because you love this God and you want to honor him with your life, welcome to the club. That's what it's about. That's what we go through. But the beautiful thing about the gospel and the beautiful thing about God is as this scripture says, when we suffer, when we endure, and when we participate in what Christ had to endure, we're actually seeing his glory revealed in us. It's beautiful that you can suffer but yet know about God even more. That you can suffer and even in a little bit, in that little moment, you can kind of identify with why Jesus went to the cross because he suffered. He suffered greatly for our freedom. He suffered greatly for our salvation. He suffered greatly so that we could come into eternity with his Father forever and ever. Why did he do that? Because he cared for every single one of us here. He cares for you tonight. So when we think about suffering, when we think about Jesus, it's like this. It went hand in hand. Therefore, if you're a believer and you're suffering, it goes hand in hand. But the beautiful thing about that, and we'll look at this before we close, is it doesn't end with suffering. Because, of course, we're serving Jesus Christ. It ends with victory. But I think it's also a moment where we have to look at ourselves because sometimes, again, we feel like we're entitled to breakthrough, right? We feel like we're entitled to blessing. And all of a sudden, the things that we do, the good things that honor God, the good things that share the gospel with people, the good things that we do, and the bad things that we turn away from, we turn from those things for our personal gain. And when it's about us and not about God getting glory, the way that we respond and the way that we react is actually, it's actually pretty upsetting. And I wanted to share a tweet from Stevie Johnson from 2010. You can put that on the screen. He dropped what would have been a game-winning pass in the end zone, and then after the game, this is what he posted on his Twitter. He said, I praise you 24 seven, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. And this how you do me, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. You expect me to learn from this. How? I'll never forget this ever. Thanks though, dot, dot, dot. And we know when you t text somebody or when you post something and the thing is, in his original uh, tweet, all of it was in caps. So everything was in caps. There was a lot of exclamation points. There was a lot of question marks. And there was a lot of ellipses. And ellipses are never good when you're ending a text message or a comment, right? We know that. And that's what he said to God. Because somehow God was supposed to get him to catch the ball for his own glory so he didn't look like an idiot on national TV, right? So he goes on this whole rant and he talks to God directly on a tweet and calls him out because he dropped a ball. It's pretty absurd. And this was a long time ago, so maybe things have changed. He's no longer with, with the Buffalo Bills. He's with another team now. But I think sometimes we can be like that. That as audacious as that reads, and as bad as that looks, sometimes we're like that with God as well in our life, right, that we were talking about. God, you, you gonna do me like that? You gonna, did that sound really bad? That was supposed to be a moment. I shouldn't talk like that, yeah. I'm not from the hood. But, um, yeah. So you're going to do me like that, God. Not smiling. Try not to smile. You're going to do all of these things to me. You're not going to answer my prayers. You're not going to give me that relationship. You're not going to give me that career. You're not going to give me all of the things that I want. How are you going to do that to me? And we put him on blast in our personal life. We shake our fists at him as if he owes us anything. But he doesn't owe us anything because he gave us everything, and his name is Jesus Christ. And that's something that we need to always remember, that in all the persecution and all of the hardship and all of the things that we're going through, at the end of the day, Jesus Christ, at the end of all of the suffering, after all of the persecution, Jesus Christ forever and ever. Point three in your notes, a follower of God is confident in God's promise to save them from eternal death. And let's go straight into Daniel 3, 16 to 18. 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into a blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hands. But even if he does not, this is key, this is what he says, even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. It was their even if faith that was radical. They believed that God would save them because that's what it says in God's word. God wor God's word says that he saves. They believed in that, but this is what they say. This is what they said. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to your God because our God is greater. Our God deserves our worship. He deserves our praise. And if we're gonna die in a burning furnace, so be it. Because God promises, saves us, promises to save us and give us eternal life. And now this isn't in your notes, but I'm gonna explain what happens after this. King Nebuchadnezzar goes seven times hotter in the furnace. He gets his strongest men, which wouldn't be me, but he gets his strongest men. He grabs Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, and he ties them up so that they can't be removed from the furnace. He throws them in the furnace. And in the moment of doing that, because the furnace was so hot, the soldiers that tied Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego burned away in an instant because it was that hot. They were thrown into the furnace, and then King Nebuchadnezzar is shocked because he expects them to burn instantly, just like how his disposable soldiers did. But then he sees a fourth person in the furnace, and then he announces to the people that are around him, it's like a son of God is in the furnace protecting them. And then he releases them from the furnace, they come out. And then King Nebuchadnezzar realizes that somebody in there, the God that they were unwilling to put behind the God that he was trying to get them to bow down to, that God saved them. That God saved them and he sent a son into that furnace to deliver them from what should have been their death. And here's the cool thing about that, is in verse 29 of Daniel 3, the king of all of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, the one who puts every decree into motion, the one that can get people to die just because they don't obey him or don't bow down to him, this is what he says. For no other God can save this way. No other God can save this way. And what he does in that moment, and this is kind of funny if you look back on it, is he makes a decree. He makes a new law. And this new law says this. If anyone in Babylon goes against the God that Meshach, Shadrach, Abednego follow, they will be immediately chopped up into pieces and their homes will be put into rubble or be made into rubble. Basically, he'll destroy their homes. It's crazy. This guy that believes so much that he could burn these believers away because they didn't bow down to him and his statues and his gods. Not only did they get set free, but they get set free and then he totally turns on everybody else and he says, I'm gonna promote these people. And now Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego weren't just the guys that were spared, they were guys that were promoted into higher levels of authority, higher levels of influence, and higher positions in Babylon. Why? Because they had faith. And here's a cool thing, because a lot of scholars believe, what does that mean he saw a son of God? There was a son of God in all of this. That son of God is Jesus Christ. And a lot of people believe that God did send his son. There was a son in that furnace that was protecting Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And that God that sent that son is the same God that sent Jesus Christ for every single one of us to not only have to endure but prosper and thrive, even in the midst of our suffering, even in the midst of our turmoil, even in the midst of what looks like our destruction. This God, this Jesus, wants to save you from it. With that said, um, could the keys come up from worship? And could the volunteers that I asked to come up, come up? Hurry up, just for the sake of time. Because this is the wrestling that we go through, right? Like, okay, you're telling me that there's this God that wants to save me. You can, can all go over here. That there's this God that wants to save me. There's this God that wants to provide for me. There's this God that wants to give me eternal life, but I don't see it right now. 
right? Everyone take a, a step up, step up, right to the front, right to the front. There you go. And to illustrate this, I wanted to talk to you guys to, about another football terminology. It's called taking a knee. And in football, when you take a knee, it's because the end result is already defined. That there's no way that a victory can be for the losing team, and there's no way that the victorious team can lose. So in those moments, every team takes a knee, right? Because the decision was already made. The end result is already determined. I cannot win. I cannot lose. I'm going to take a, take a knee, and this game is over. And sometimes we treat our personal life with God that way, that the sin that I struggle with, the things that I'm going through, the things that I'm enduring will never change. The prayers that I'm asking for that you're not answering me on my timing, that will never change, so I'm gonna dig out on you. And we say, because you're not answering my relationship, I'm gonna take a knee. You say, because you're not healing people that I'm believing for, I'm gonna take a knee. You say, because I'm not gonna be able to prosper and thrive in my life, I'm gonna take a knee, I'm gonna serve this. I'm gonna join any relationship that I can get affirmation in. I can join any, any party and, and join anything and I can feel love. I'm gonna not forgive my parents because things aren't gonna change. I'm gonna just do my life my way. I'm gonna live it my way. I'm gonna do everything my way because God, you can't provide for me. And then we take a knee because there's no way that things can change, but this isn't the God that we serve. Tonight, God doesn't want any of us to take a knee because the victory isn't on the ground. The victory is in heaven. It's God, and he sent his son to the ground so that even if we're on our knees praying, we can actually stand because God hears our prayers because he loves us, because he wants to prosper us, because he does want to bring healing through our life, because he does care about us, because he does want to restore our family, because he does want us to be influential, because he does hear everything that we say. The God that we serve wants this generation to stand. You guys can go off. Thank you. I'm gonna to read to you guys one of my favorite scriptures that wraps this message together. It's in Revelations 21, three to five. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more mourning or death or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego was delivered by Jesus Christ from what should have been their death. And you're here and you're wondering like how much can God love me because I'm going through this, because I struggle with this, because these people think of me this way. And we're kind of struggling with whether we're a fan or a follower of, Christ, of God because of the circumstances and situations that we're a part of. And then we're taking knees. And we're like, just send me to the furnace. Send me to burn. Because I can't do this God thing anymore. I can't do this Christian thing anymore. I can't take a stand for my faith. I can't deny the sin that I'm going through anymore. I can't forgive the people that God's called me to, to forgive. I can't keep on praying. If things aren't changing the way that I want it on my timing, I give up. I'm off the bandwagon. I'm not loved. I'm not cared about. But in the story of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, we see how God delivers. We see how he restores. And most importantly, we see how he saves. And the beautiful thing about Revelations is this, when God restores this earth or when we die and we go to heaven, there's gonna be a moment where he takes a knee for us. See, this scripture says something that I had to wrestle with one day. I was like, what does that look like? What does that mean? That God would wipe every tear from their eyes, that there will be no more mourning or death. How would he wipe our tears away? Because this is this enormous God and I'm just this person, you know? I'd imagine God to be very big. <laughs> This is how I imagine, at least. So this isn't theological, this isn't historical. He would take a knee. And then he would look us in the face. And those tears of that you're crying in heaven, I believe those are tears of joy. 
because you know now where you're at and you're crying because you're so happy to be with your father. You're so happy that you were saved and delivered. And then God, because this is who God is, he looks us in the eye and he wipes every tear from our eyes. That's the knee that God takes for us. And then we get to be in eternity with him forever. And I think that's tonight, God wants some of us to rise up. And in this moment, I just want, I believe God is softening a lot of our hearts. And I'm just believing that in the midst of worship and in the midst of all of this, God is speaking to you about being bold in your faith, about not being afraid of the furnace, about having an even if mentality, that even if you don't do this, I will not bow down to any idol or any other God because you're my God, because you'll save me. And even if I don't experience it here, I'm gonna be in eternity forever with you. And nothing will compare to that. So if you're here, I'm gonna ask everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes. And then you guys are ready to take a stand for your faith, even if it's just that one person. I'm believing that God wants to unleash a Shadrach, Meshach, and a Abednego generation into our world and into this state. And if that's you, and you're saying, God, I am ready to take a stand for my faith, I'm willing to take a stand for who you are in my life. I'm willing to continue to persevere and endure because you persevered and endured through your son for me. And if that's you, just between you and God, I wanna ask you to stand, to get off of your knees and take a stand on three. One, two, three. If you're here and you're willing to answer to who God is, take a stand. You don't have to feel forced. You don't have to feel obligated. It's just if that's in your heart. And even if you've been a Christian your whole life, you can stand because this speaks to all of us. And what we're going to do right now is for everyone that's standing, Chad and Leanne, our campus ministers, they're going to pray an impartation of faith over every single one of you.